Carol, thank you so much for that introduction. I want to welcome everyone that has joined today's webcast. Uh, looking at the registration, uh, if quite, quite bluntly, it's an incredible uh, number of people and uh, uh, geographically, a uh, fantastic, fantastic representation from so many different regions and so many different industries. So clearly, this is an important topic to you, and we are so pleased to have this opportunity to uh, discuss this topic. Uh, I'm also very pleased that I'm joined with two esteemed colleagues, Ted Gary and Dean Parsons. Uh, Dean and I are going to be kicking off uh, the beginning of this webcast with uh, some, some information relating to a white paper that Dean and I have co-written here. And this will be available to you. In fact, it already is. Look for a link that will be supplied during this webcast, and it will also be archived in a few different places. You'll get more information on that shortly here. Um, the, um, the intent with today's, uh, today's webinar is to explore uh, some of the complexity, the challenges, but also some recommended solutions for IT, OT asset discovery. This is obviously uh, uh, one of those areas that can be a challenge. I'm sure many of you have experienced uh, uh, situations where you have um, not been able to find everything in your system or uh, sporadically things would uh, come and go as you're conducting your inventories. Uh, to, the intent of today is to discuss this topic but also give you some practical insights and recommendations for how to get after this. Um, there'll also be discussion and Q&A, and uh, just a reminder on the question and answer side of things, you have an opportunity to submit your questions. We welcome those, and we'll try to incorporate those into the discussion. So um, the objectives, to be more specific, and uh, Dean and I will be tag-teaming um, this as well, are to uh, begin to discuss why digital asset inventories are so critical for IT, OT converged systems, the security risks and, and the challenges with managing these systems. Uh, can knowledge about these risks and vulnerabilities lead us to better risk management? Uh, obviously, that's an important uh, aspect to conducting these uh, inventories and managing systems throughout their life cycles are the risk profile that uh, exists at a given instant in time, but also the risk posture of a system that can change over time. And then we're also gonna dig into the Center for Internet Security, the CIS controls, and take a closer look at just uh, three of those and, uh, and, and discuss how they can make a difference to the security posture of today's control systems. So uh, what we thought is a good place to start is just a bit of reflection on the ongoing change that we see throughout industry, this, uh, this industrial digitalization that uh, continues its march. So many decades have passed where we have seen control systems, we have seen enterprise IT systems that were once disconnected, somewhat isolated from each, each other, begin to share information uh, between them um, in an effort to increase uh, the uh, efficiency of how a business operates, the efficiency of uh, production systems, the efficiency of business operations. That march obviously continues, and uh, that is that is really the namesake of ITOT convergence is that vertical integration. But we should also not forget that across industries, and uh, of course business to business, there is integration and information sharing that happens all the time. So we have these very large, complex systems that we are expected to manage. So scale and size is, is definitely a challenge. Uh, we know that they grow in complexity and, uh, and connectivity is of course going to continue to increase over time. And regrettably, there are threats out there that can impact um, the, uh, the way that these systems operate. So uh, this is precisely why it's such an important topic for us today to make sure that we have a clear understanding of how these systems are architected and, of course, what is connected. And this march of ITOT convergence, as I mentioned, it has been happening over the decades. If we go back uh, just, a, just a couple of decades ago, uh, the, uh, the systems that were being installed were lar largely isolated. Uh, we, we oftentimes use the, the uh, air gap uh, words to describe some of these older systems. And, and air gapping, although we, we recognize that is not an absolute, it is one way of discussing these older systems because they were largely isolated from the business, the other business systems. They had proprietary protocols, they were disconnected, there were not the network paths or pathways that we see today that were interlinking them into the rest of the organization, nor were there 
the, uh, the number of remote connections that we often see today. Over time, all of that has changed. And uh, especially as Ethernet reached into the process systems and the factories, Internet protocol IP technology is uh, also reaching those endpoints that has led to all this connectivity. And the level of risk, the cyber risk associated uh, over the years has of course increased with each step of the way, each new connection, uh, each new method of, of uh, interacting with these systems and sharing information. And our ability to offset these risks has also changed from a, a point in the past where physical controls were more than adequate for controlling much of the security risk to today where we are challenged uh, where we have to apply digital controls and have clear insight as to how these systems are architected and and take precautions to uh, to understand the threats and to uh, mitigate those threats everywhere possible security is definitely doable in, to do to, in today's systems, but it is challenging. It, re, it requires all of us to be vigilant and to have this clear understanding. So the life cycle management of converged systems, extremely important. Uh, every system goes through a design phase, a build, operate, and maintain phase. And the subject of today with us looking specifically at how do we identify the assets that are connected linked directly into this life cycle when we have an opportunity at the design phase to know precisely what devices should be connected, should be engineered into a system, and to have controls in place to make sure that they are appropriate. Uh, likewise, as we build the system, uh, ensuring that the uh, this devices that are connected are, are still the ones that we intended to, and that no additional devices that, that should not be there have been added or to remove devices that are used as part of a commissioning process. And likewise, through the operate and maintenance phase, uh, controlling those assets uh, is, is equally important. So in order for us to have that capability of managing the life cycle, that clear understanding of what's connected at all phases of this life cycle is essential. So the contemporary IT OT network architecture and uh, this is a picture that we have pulled from the uh, Department of Homeland Security, just as a representation of a, uh, a reference architecture. Um, this, this really does represent uh, some, some of the basis of how to um, architect a defensible system. So having physical and logical segmentation architected into networks, following a zone conduit model and establishing security perimeters and ensuring that there are controls at those security perimeters. These are all factors that are built into a reference architecture and a defensible architecture. The concept of a demilitarized zone uh, to separate the enterprise IT from the operational technology side. So these are the foundational elements of a network architecture. And it's through this architecture that we actually have a number of opportunities where we can begin to assess identify and track the assets that are connected. Um, at this point, I'd like to pull Dean into the conversation because what we're going to discuss now are some of the methods that are used in order to begin to identify uh, these devices in these, uh, these reference architectures and, and applied architectures. So Dean, would you like to lead us um, you know, into some further conversation on this? Absolutely, thank you, Doug. Thanks everybody. Um, as Doug mentioned here, with a properly architected network, it actually creates natural points of uh, monitoring. So if you just follow the standard architecture, you're actually setting yourself up very well. If you're building something new or re-architecting something, uh, to do what we're about to talk about in a moment, understand what assets we have on the ICS network, uh, we're actually uh, well suited to do asset discovery at that point, to, again, to understand what we have, to do defense upon that as well. So here what we have is uh, we know that data is exchanged in a number of different levels, right from the uh, DMZ zone right down to uh, the lower level. And what we have to be cautious of is each one of these levels has some amount of segmentation for us to control that, to do proper access control on. Uh, but again, those uh, different uh, layers or levels will give us those natural points where we can do additional monitoring there. The challenges in these cases here, as we know, the unknown and unauthorized architecture bypasses. We have to be diligent in setting the architecture up, but also maintaining the architecture so that if changes do happen and changes are required, then there is no access control list or other parts of the uh, network that are exposed. 
when changes do happen, they have to be controlled and security has to be checked after each change. And, and Dean, I, I'm assuming you would agree with this statement that that even this picture is quite idealistic. This is this is that reference architecture, but in many practical settings, the way that systems have been installed, they they were installed as flat networks, and there was some degree of evolution over time. You would agree with that, right? Absolutely. This is certainly the ideal situation. And if we were going to build an industrial control system cookie factory today, this is probably where we would start. Uh, but uh, typically what we are seeing is kind of retrofitting some security into today's kind of uh, threat landscape due to the threats getting increasingly more sophisticated and increasing in volume. So this is absolutely right, Doug. This is ideal scenario, but it's something we can all work towards for sure. Very good. And and keep this picture in mind as we move forward here, because what, what we want to focus on now are some of those methods of how do we begin to assess what's connected and, and get a handle on how that will change over time. So the Center for Internet Security uh, posts uh, their CIS controls, uh, oftentimes known as the top 20. And uh, these can be very useful in helping to identify um, uh, mitigations and methods of addressing risk in a variety of areas when it comes to securing such systems. So some of the challenges you know, relevant to, to today's conversation are thinking about how difficult it can be to protect something that you don't know is even connected to your system. And what about your system if you don't even know all that is in the system, uh, the functionality, the capability, um, uh, the, the duration for when something is connected, if, uh, if it should become disconnected, if it's not a persistent device. And, and then likewise, what type of uh, exposure do we have uh, for devices if they're not kept current, if there are vulnerabilities in devices because they're not being patched or vulnerabilities aren't adequately being managed. So, so these controls dig into um, those three items but much deeper into a variety of topics. So it, it might be useful if you, if you haven't looked at those to, to, um, to evaluate those and see if they can uh, assist you in your endeavors to, sue, to uh, protect your systems. So we're gonna focus specifically on the top three CIS controls for conducting inventory of control and hardware assets, inventory of control and software assets, and then we're also going to discuss continuous vulnerability management as well. So uh, around the topic of conducting that uh, asset inventory, uh, it, it is important for us to not overlook that there is still a physical element in addition to the digital uh, avenues that we have at finding devices. And uh, the physical inventories are still, is still extremely useful, but I'm sure many of you have found that it's not adequate at, at building that comprehensive, that complete picture of your system. So we will also talk about passive monitoring, active scanning methodologies, and then a variety of additional sources that contain information uh, from appliances in your system, from endpoints in your system that collectively build that comprehensive picture. So we're gonna start walking through each one of these individually, and Dean and I are gonna tag team this, this portion as well. So the physical inventory is one of those areas where, uh, you know, basically this is the, uh, uh, um, the, the point where you are walking around following cables, uh, looking for devices, a um, lot, of, lot of manual labor involved here, but, but very useful um, because you know, this, this, is, uh, this is an area where you can come in direct contact with devices that may otherwise be difficult to reach by digital means. So um, you know, the picture that we're highlighting here is just to a reminder that this is a comprehensive activity. And sometimes the challenges that we face with conducting physical inventories are that, uh, that many of these devices, the way that they are, uh, many of these systems, the way that they are architected, uh, the devices are actually abstracted away from what can be visually seen. And the more that we move to segmented systems and, and, and systems that are using cloud-based services, just that question of, is that asset part of my system can be uh, one of the most difficult uh, questions to answer. So Dean, I, I know you have a lot of uh, um, um, you know, uh, things to add, some, some commentary to add here. So uh, you know, please go ahead. 
Yeah, absolutely. So as Doug mentioned, physical inventory is one of the four main methodologies here we're going to discuss. Uh, I really find physical inventory actually getting to an industrial control system site uh, very, very valuable in many ways. As Doug mentioned, though, I don't want to discount the idea that it is going to be labor intensive. However, there's many benefits, and I've seen those things directly in the energy sector. Getting on site not only gets you, uh, you know, tracing wires with your hard hat on, your, your your boots and all these things, and your safety gear, your personal protective equipment, which is necess a necessity for most sites for your physical safety. It gets you talking to people on the plant floor. So from a cybersecurity point of view, creating the relationships between the uh, IT folks, if you will, and the OT folks, overall having an understanding of cybersecurity, meeting on the plant floor enables you to kind of take that uh, relationship to another step, have trust relationships between IT and OT. So as Doug, uh, as we see here, uh, getting on site, we see some photographs here of folks actually going on the plant floor. That's where we need to be, tracing this, uh, tracing the cables back to assets. As Doug pointed out, though, things like cloud security, there are uh, some things you could be missing in that location, in that, in that uh, kind of methodology. Indeed. And, and Dean, just to add to that, um, you know, the picture of the locks is indicative of those areas of a system that you may not have access to. Uh, that those can be control rooms, those can be control cabinets, those might be hazardous areas that uh, right. would put human life at risk as well. So, so those introduce challenges of that physical inventory of, of ever reaching uh, the areas of the system to actually see and come in contact with those systems. Right. Some sites I've seen as well have uh, uh, co-ownership of certain sites, so those locks are actually very valid. You could be on a site and uh, share a site and not have access because that's not your area of responsibility, yet it would uh, impact the actual process. You need to consider those things on site as well. Yeah. And Dean, why don't you lead us right into the passive monitoring and discovery topic? Absolutely. So uh, unlike physical inventory, passive monitoring actually is looking at the network in a very passive way. The idea behind passive monitoring and discovery is not to inject anything into the network. So you're not creating packets. You're not uh, requesting or interrogating devices at all. Passive monitoring and discovery is really about collecting the data that the, nat that the network naturally uh, generates in the process. And there are several ways to do that as well. But uh, with passive monitoring, you do have some limitations, as you'd imagine. Um, but you, you, you can complement the physical inventory, for example, with the passive or one of the others as well. I think Doug might agree that not one uh, methodology that we're going to talk about of the four here would be the complete picture of your network and your asset inventory. Largely what we have seen across the, uh, the uh, community is, is one coupled with another, you know, one complementing the other. And what I have found with regards to passive monitoring is complementing that with the physical has been very valuable. Uh, yeah, in, go ahead. Yeah, in, indeed, Dean. I, I, I would, I would echo that statement and, and even amplify it. That all, all four of these collectively are, are so important at building a comprehensive view. And the reason why that life cycle picture is there is a reminder that these are not static systems. Although there are many aspects of the system operation that, that will be static, uh, throughout the life of a system. Um, there are plenty of times that a system is, is taken into a maintenance mode where new assets are temporarily connected in order to uh, alter operation, to, to change a configuration. Sometimes those systems are also expanded. So uh, these are not one and done approaches. Even passive monitoring uh, needs, you know, is uh, one of the benefits that comes with a passive monitoring solution is that it is more active. Uh, over time, contrast with a physical inventory that the labor involved with that generally encourages uh, companies to conduct physical inventories only periodically as opposed right. to continuously. Right. Absolutely. Okay. So, so Dean, um, this particular picture here, this, this architecture is a good representation of uh, segmented systems. Um, you know, some of the challenges that can be introduced from network appliances that may or may not provide the level of services necessary in order to have listening points to extract the information. You know, could you talk a little bit about, um, you know, these connection points and how information is extracted and, and analyzed for the passive monitoring discovery process? Absolutely. So you see here in the network diagram a number of key elements that you'll have in, in most uh, ICS networks. 
what you'll find is firewalls and switches. And in, in, in a lot of cases, these uh, devices can have uh, a capability called network mirror or span capability features. If you do have this uh, type of equipment with these features, then setting up passive monitoring will be relatively straightforward. Of course, you'll want to go through normal change management and whatnot protocols, but uh, essentially you're not disrupting the network at all uh, to do any configuration here, or sorry, to do any capturing of traffic. Again, passive monitoring is not active at this point. So configuring these key elements to do mirror slash span will give you the uh, a mirror image, if you will, of the traffic that the network normally sees to uh, control a certain uh, industrial control system process. Uh, so that's uh, that, that's one way to approach it with these configurations. Now there's other ways to do that as well. You can use something called a tap, and a tap can uh, be used to do effectively the same thing. However, using a tap uh, does require a temporary break in the network to install a uh, another piece of hardware to do that. We've seen both used in production in many ICS environments. And the biggest thing is, is when you do have a break in the network, obviously you may, you want to go through change management for that, uh, but also the, uh, the tap is inserted into your network then, so it is a bump on the wire. So it's another consideration there as well. Some of the limitations we talked about here is how the network is architect. If you do have segments where you cannot collect, obviously you're not going to get data from those segmented areas. But if we do follow that uh, best practice network uh, architecture diagrams we, we've talked about earlier, you're going to really set yourself up for a way to get collection in a, in a very, um, I guess, trivial way. Some of the risks we talk about here, uh, as Doug lined out, is uh, the window for analysis. Uh, some of the questions we do get on this is how long do we do passive monitoring for? When we set up the, uh, the mirror port or spam ports, how long do we do that packet capture or PCAP collection? Uh, so in, in my experience, what I really have found is this process can be very quick. Uh, you can do a, a passive monitoring collection of PCAPs with uh, you know 24 to 72 hours to be a really effective way to get an understanding of what's happening in your network. Uh, and the other question we get is, well, does it depend on where the process is? During the startup of the process, will you get more? Uh, and, th and that is absolutely the case. Doing passive monitoring, the startup of an actual industrial control system process is really the, uh, the prime time to get that. And the reason for that is because some devices, for example, will only communicate in certain times. So the startup is a really good uh, a window for that. Two to three days uh, of, a, of a packet capture, and you have a lot of information about what devices are naturally communicating on your network, what protocols are using as well. Yeah, Dean, and, and just to add to that, so when, when we have an architecture with more contemporary or more capable network appliances that can support, say, R-SPAN services, for instance, you know, that, that, that becomes quite convenient because then we can begin to aggregate the data that is seen at lower levels or, or other, other points in a system. Um, that gives us an opportunity to centralize uh, the data, to centralize the analysis that is conducted on that data. However, not every system, of course, has the most contemporary of products or the most capable of products. And, and it's quite likely that in the control system space, usually um, there, are, or there are at least some pockets or some, some areas that will require direct interaction. And that's that oftentimes, to, to your point, Dean, uh, requires some type of a, a physical hardware tap. So, um, so what, what that means is as we apply different uh, different approaches to extracting that information, it may benefit someone to introduce a management network as a backhaul to collect this information and to still move it to a central location just Absolutely. to ease the analyst process, the analysis process of all of that data. Anything Absolutely. to add to that, Dean? No, absolutely. Really well covered. Okay, perfect. Let's uh, let's go ahead and press on then. All right. So we're we're going to shift just a bit to the to the third item here, which is active scanning and discovery. And active scanning and discovery. Uh, this this can be an a Especially, especially a challenge for older systems that are much more fragile in nature. Uh, you know, we we. We oftentimes, you know, think of the control systems uh, as having a lifespan measured in decades, not just years. And uh, many of the products that are uh, quite happily operating today and effectively operating today 
were designed and installed many years ago. So they're not always the most resilient when it comes to, um, to unusual circumstances of communication in a system. So when we discuss active scanning and discovery, it's a, we're going to draw the important distinction that this is an engineered approach, taking a very careful approach at how devices are communicated with and how information is received from those uh, devices. So uh, we wanted to, to put that out there very early that uh, uh, active scanning and discovery is something that it really requires a calculated approach, but uh, it is doable. And uh, this becomes a fantastic way to complement the physical and passive monitoring and discovery process. So, Dean, you want to take us a little deeper into this one? Absolutely. There's definitely uh, cautions there for sure, but it can be done. Uh, what we have found, though, is testing something like this, obviously, in a lab setting, is, is definitely going to be your best bet. Uh, so that's, that's the typical approach we would usually uh, suggest. The difference between passive and active scanning here, though, or active mon or passive monitoring, is really when you're doing passive monitoring, you get natural communications between device A and device B and device C. Active scanning and discovery it gives you a lot of additional information, but it may not give you, um, in certain cases, of what devices are talking to what. With active scanning, you're actually um, invoking a device to respond to you. In doing that, though, with an authenticated active scan, you can pull more information from the asset. So as we talked about earlier, no one of these methodologies is going to be your, your catch-all. You have to kind of aggregate this with other methodologies for sure as well. But in general, active scanning can be set up and tested and it can be uh, very well uh, uh, served. Right, so what we have here is a general uh, architecture of an active scanner that would be set up. Uh, again, having the collection uh, coming back to a central point or central points of control and collection is, is important. And these can be in line uh, or, or out of line depending on the, uh, I guess, scenario and implementation. The idea here is the limitations with regards to the uh, device infrastructure capabilities. You always want to make sure that what you're interrogating and asking on the network to respond is capable of doing that. The risks we talked about, there's a complex uh, scenario there with older devices, so you need to be very cautious on that. But again, it comes back to routing and segmentation. You have to be set up to do this. Architecture, again, is the common theme here to have set up correctly. So as Doug mentioned earlier in the life cycle of when you're putting things on the network and uh, testing them, designing them, implementation, you want to make sure you're thinking ahead there from a security perspective to do asset identification, not only segmentation for uh, security purposes for uh, access control lists either. Yeah, and, and Dean, given that the network appliances here become those um, those critical instruments for allowing access to to other parts of the system, the configuration management is is an area that has to be closely monitored, maintained, and it also has to be secured, doesn't it? Because if there was a misconfiguration, uh, it could be possible that some of the methods that are used to identify assets that you, you may not want to necessarily apply in other areas of your system could potentially be misrouted in that direction, for instance. So, so managing uh, those configurations in those active appliances is, is just an essential element with this approach. Absolutely, the configuration is essential, but also access to those scanners as well. So if, if, if we as defenders use these systems to understand what we have to do defense, an adversary as well can use these systems if they get access to it to do the same thing, to map out those networks from a cyber attack point of view as well. So you're absolutely right. The configuration around these devices and the access control to these devices really is, is, is definitely going to be essential. These tools can be used for good or bad purposes. Yeah, and, and, and Dean, I remember, uh, you know, when, when we were writing the, the paper itself, you know, we discussed the uh, LLDP protocol specifically and, and how useful that can be, but also how that can be misused if it is left enabled. Right. LLDP, link layered uh, protocol, we've actually seen that being, um, well, left on or implemented by default after some commissioning. Uh, so we, we've seen that, and, and it's, it's common to see that. So it, and it's a great protocol. I mean, it's, it's fairly safe to use. Uh, caveat, you know, test before you do active scanning. But it is uh, very valuable. It can, it can suck a lot of information from a device to show you, but the adversary also can abuse that once on the network. So if they are on the network, 
this LLDP is a part of the ICS environment. What's interesting about that, though, is that it's a, if it's abused, that legitimate protocol or legitimate service or tools, it's going to be harder for the uh, intrusion detection analysts and your, your cybersecurity defenders to detect anomalous behavior because that is not malware. LLDP is something that we legitimately use. So you need to be cautious about, in general, what services are on the network, what can be abused. And a general statement is really to harden your systems and harden the network protocols anyway. Make sure that what you know is on your network is safe to be there. Yeah, and Dean, that's a perfect lead-in because you know we're talking about ITOT convergence, and uh, it, it is so important for us to keep in mind the variety of protocols that are used, not only to operate these systems, but but there are protocols that are used almost exclusively for um, for pulling configuration information or monitoring or conducting diagnostics and prognostics. O OT systems, especially, we have many specialized protocols that. Uh, are operating at the data link layer exclusively. And what that means is that uh, if there is potential for blind spots if the tools that are being used to, uh, to, to listen to the network and analyze the network, um, network traffic are not tuned into uh, looking at uh, data link layer protocols. Uh, it is possible that this will be a blind spot, a nagging blind spot in a system and, and certain assets will be missed. So, so Dean, uh, I'm, I'm gonna push us forward in the interest of time um, because we have all these additional sources of information that are equally available in addition to passive and active scanning methodologies. So um, you know, maybe, maybe just touch on a, a couple of these here that can also be useful. Absolutely, so the uh, additional sources here are really devices that you can pull logs and information and configuration files from. So these would exist in your network today. These are uh, operating system logs you could pull, event uh, logs from assets that you have, obviously routers and firewalls, we're talking about the uh, the CAM tables, the uh, the MAC information, routing tables, et cetera, and firewalls. The access control list will inherently tell you what you're going to allow in your network, and will also give you a log of what's been seen and allowed or denied from your network as well. So, but it's really important to take all of these different types of log in many assets across your network and, and put them into a central location for processing. So this is what we're gonna see that this could be a lot of time uh, devoted to getting this type of information uh, into one place to make it useful as well. Uh, even logic program can be helpful with determining what's on the network and what's actually going to be uh, communicating. Syslog is huge as well. Uh, and also the typical NetFlow data, the five tuple data, we'll call it. Uh, all that information are other sources of, uh, of data which don't require a tap or uh, a span port to be configured. Yeah, and, and Dean, I, I think that collectively when we start adding up the physical inventory with, with continuous passive monitoring, complementing it with active scanning and those additional data sources, it becomes pretty tough for any device to hide. And, and especially especially that continuous element because you know uh, we see so many mobile devices and, and devices that are not always persistent in a network coming and going. That continuous element really is that essential. So I know you and I, we boiled this down into you know one easy, easy chart. Didn't say simple, I'm just saying easy. Uh, but uh, uh, but but this this is one one way that um, that you know we should be thinking about that process of of uh, identifying uh, uh, assets and uh, and what is fitting for one um, one organization may not necessarily be fitting for another and likewise architectures are not equal as we've already discussed so uh, you know so so you know give consideration as you're making your own decisions as to what the best approach may be for you and uh, uh, and how they link together so Dean we're gonna we're gonna move into uh, the comprehensive uh, uh, inventory uh, benefits here so you know we know that that once we have a view of what's connected it can help us uh, gain a better understanding of what might be introducing risk to these systems. Um, but, but that also drives us down a path of uh, vulnerability management because now we have an, a clearer understanding of what's connected and now we can assess uh, what the vintage is of the product, the, how current a product is to its most, uh, most recent release of, of software or, for, or firmware. And it also gives us the ability to know if there are 
documented vulnerabilities against those devices. So that inventory is really leading us right into that level of information. And this prime question of, do we patch a device or don't we patch a device? Because this is by far, uh, this is far and away not an easy question to answer. Um, and uh, and, and I, th I think it would be useful for us just to, to reflect a bit on the pros and cons very briefly here. So, um, so Dean, why don't you take the, uh, the protagonist view of uh, patching and I'll try and take the opposite. <laughs> well, let's, let's focus on, um, you know, if we do patch, let's look at that for a moment. If we do patch, known vulnerabilities that are pushed out there, we're gonna patch, we're gonna be, obviously you would assume in a, in a better situation, patches are gonna be pull, applied, vulnerabilities are reduced as a result. Uh, it's gonna obviously ensure your compliance and it's gonna reduce any liabilities you have as well. It could also improve not only security, but also performance as well. In, indeed, let's, let's talk about downtime. In order for me to patch, uh, a system, oftentimes I have to at least uh, isolate and take some some portion of a system down. That's going to cost me time, that's going to cost me money, and don't patches also introduce risk in some cases to the devices or the entire system? Absolutely, that is certainly the case. I guess what it boils down to is that there's really two avenues here. The idea is to patch, but patch smartly, right? Patch, uh, get an understanding first of how a vulnerability affects your system, i.e., if you get threat intelligence to say this particular software or asset is affected by a vulnerability with a, a very high expectation of exploitation, uh, then, then you need to look at that through your threat intelligence and apply it to your asset inventory. If you do have that asset, if you, when you have your inventory, you can see are you infected, affected or not. If you're affected, smartly patch that in different ways. And it might not necessarily be patch it now, you can potentially patch it later as well. So patch smartly, I think, is a real main message we want to get across here. I, I like that a lot because you know, for for many customers, uh, I'm sorry, for many for many users, uh, that concept of patching, um, there's some time element applied to it, and there's also that consideration of well, maybe maybe it's better to just mitigate the associated risk by applying controls elsewhere in my system, where I don't necessarily have to patch a device, but I can still address associated risk. And, and that's, you know, I know that's something that, that you and I discuss a lot is, is how do you assess, how do you make that assessment of uh, where the risk is and what steps can be taken to begin mitigating some of that risk. So the common vulnerability scoring system, you know, this is, uh, uh, this, this is one, of those, um, one of those tools that's available to us because it characterizes uh, a level of severity and associated risk with known vulnerabilities. And uh, for, for those of you that might not be aware, uh, many vulnerability disclosures include information around the CVSS concept. And this is, this is really intended to help you gain um, a somewhat immediate view of the level of severity and associated risk uh, because it is a numerical number applied to this. Uh, but but it is it is a very uh, it, it is um, it is more than just a, a single number that comprises this severity scale and and this is precisely why we're discussing it today is that the components that build up into a CVSS score uh, can be very very useful avenues for you to begin to decide. Uh, where additional security controls can be applied if you're not able to patch devices directly. So this mathematical formula has, you know, the components that you see here. And, you know, um, Dean, what, what you and I talk about so often is instead of just looking at that base level score, let's think about the individual constituents that comprise that risk and start to apply, um, you know, different practices to address uh, associated risk. And by focusing on each of those, we can begin reducing that overall score as, as opposed to, you know, which will, will definitely help us through that patch or not patch conversation. So anything to add on this, please? Yeah, absolutely. So you make really good points here. Um, you know, patching, you know, the idea is not to fear the patch, but patch smartly and, and not necessarily patch when you need to patch. This numeric score is going to give you an understanding of how critical that vulnerability is to a service. You can bring that score down like we talked about here with regards to additional monitoring or working um, an additional control in place. 
Uh, here's a practical example. Um, in energy organization, for example, in the middle of winter, they find a vulnerability in software that they're using, and this vulnerability could be exploited by attackers that are that's publicly known at this point. Uh, do they patch? Well, in the middle of winter in an area that's kind of north, like in Canada, eh? uh, if we have a lot of storms and, 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 and cold weather, it's not an optimal time to change the process to in increase a risk of the system going down as a result of a patch. Yet the vulnerability remains. So how do you work around that? So again, patch primarily in this context is really about understanding what's there. Can you do controls between, I don't know, now in the middle of winter and perhaps in spring uh, so you can get through the winter to keep the actual ICS process up, patch smartly when you can without disrupting the system. The idea here again is really to maintain the safety and reliability of operations and that's utmost. Yeah, and, and Dean, I'll add to that earlier, we, we spoke about passive monitoring, active scanning being continuous processes here. Mm -hmm. and, and for those occasions where it's just impractical uh, to, to actually reach devices, to disrupt system operation in order to apply a product upgrade, the, the fact that you have continuous monitoring in place can really assist because, because you can begin to shift your focus towards the identification uh, aspect of looking for, uh, for new threats that are entering a system and anticipating uh, uh, items that might disrupt a system. So Absolutely. in other words, in other words, that monitoring has an added, added benefit of not just identifying connected assets, but of course, looking for threats uh, that may be much more meaningful when you just have unpatchable devices. And just one more quick comment on that. If we take patching and uh, monitoring and put them together, in a lot of cases when a patches are applied, even in some older devices, a patch can actually introduce more capabilities to do monitoring. For example, we've seen uh, PLCs, vendors of uh, programmable logic controllers and plant floors, come out with new firmware updates and patches that provides syslog, for example, where it did not before. So these patches can also uh, give you features for your consistent uh, active monitoring as well. Those are great points, Dean. So we're reaching a conclusion for this part before we turn it over to Ted Gary. And uh, just, just to conclude, so IT and OT have already converged. We know that it's over. Just embrace it. We don't need to talk about IT, OT convergence as something in the future. Um, not all discovery approaches are equal. Use your logic and patch smartly and understand your assets um, because that is going to help you address your risk surfaces and, and make smarter decisions about uh, how to manage systems throughout their life. So with that, uh, we're going to, to uh, transition now to, uh, to Ted Gary. So um, Ted, please uh, jump into the conversation at this point. All right, thank you, Doug and Dean. This has been excellent. In the next couple of minutes, I just wanna expand and amplify on a couple of things that you said and focus a little bit on just the maintenance part of the life cycle. So, the objective there is it says manage but avoid adding new risks. And I just think that the risk assessment needs to be an explicit part of the maintenance life cycle. So obviously when you make changes to devices and to your network, you can introduce new risks that need to be mitigated. But I think a key point is that even if you don't change anything, the environment from a risk point of view can change. There can be new vulnerabilities discovered that weren't there a month ago or a week ago that could be very important to you. And as Dean kind of mentioned, some of them can be, uh, there can be new exploits to them. So the threat landscape can change as well. So the point that I wanna focus on is while we're in this maintenance phase, even if you're not making uh, changes to your devices and your network, you need to, incorporate that risk assessment into the maintenance phase. So let's look at a couple of common practices, how things are done today. Uh, and I'm playing on what you guys said about patching here, where if it isn't broke, don't fix it. And I think this in the risk management uh, in terms of maintenance would be, let's just not incorporate risk management into the maintenance. That, that's not the way we've done it in the past. We've gotten by in the past, so let's proceed. And the pros with that is obviously it's easy and there's no investment required, no new budget required. If you have a tight budget, you don't need to get additional passive monitoring or active scanning capabilities. And 
no additional training is required. You don't need to use outside consultants and you're not gonna perturb your devices. So these are the pros of doing nothing. But again, the cons is that you're ignoring that changing risk environment, which is is pretty risky in, its, in itself. And it's going to increase your risk of a cyber event, of, of a successful cyber event. And one thing that we don't have time to get into in terms of uh, detail today is just the notion of due care and due diligence, which says you need to do things in a reasonable way in terms of security. And if the if you kind of have your head in the sand about risk assessment, that's not going to be reasonable. If you have an outage that causes a problem, you may be held liable for not meeting that due care and due diligence standard. So the next common practice is really assessing risk during a shutdown. And we see that happen a lot where organizations will use active scanning while they're in a shutdown mode so they can inventory the devices and the software, which we talked about, access the vulnerabilities, which we've talked about, and also analyze the configuration. So we didn't drill into this in detail, but going back to the CIS controls, I think that's control number five, is to make sure that the devices are hardened according to some hardening standards. So the pros of doing this during a shutdown, that you can get this additional information, and you're not gonna perturb the devices in a way that will, will cause an outage. And the cons really have to do with the timeliness of the information that you're getting. So shutdowns are a real time crunch. You wanna be shut down as little as possible and get as much done as you possibly can. And it can be very difficult when you do a scan to get that information back, to analyze it, prioritize your mitigation, and then implement it in time. So this is better than doing nothing, but I think it does put you under some additional time pressure. So that leads to the uh, the first recommended practice, and that's to do this continuous passive monitoring that we've talked about. And the the way you can use this information about your assets and your vulnerabilities is I'm going to jump into this informing the remediation triage there. And that is that you can put the vulnerabilities into three buckets. The first would be due to the criticality of the asset or the process and the threat landscape and the criticality of the vulnerability that we just talked about. I need to do something about this now. It may not be patching, but you can put some compensating controls in place. If nothing else, you could put stronger monitoring in place to see if there's any unusual activity associated with the device. So hopefully there'll be just a few uh, vulnerabilities that fit this immediate category. And then the next one would be the ones that you could address during a shutdown. And then the third category, and hopefully it's the largest, would be low priority vulnerabilities, things that you're not going to make a special effort to address. They might be addressed by patches that you applied in the second category, but they're not going to take explicit action. So that's the pros of this continuous monitoring. And in terms of cons, we've talked about those already, about having the access points, understanding the OT protocols. And, and another is just that you only do see the active devices uh, that are on the, on the network. If they're not active, for some reason, you're not gonna see those. So that's the continuous, or the recommended practice number one. Number two is, something we've alluded to, and that's what I'd call controlled active scanning. So you can limit active scanning to certain IP addresses. You can also limit it to the number and the types of ports that it scans, which ports it scans. So we have a number of customers, and at first this surprised me until I got into discussions with them, that are using active scanning very cautiously, very carefully. They've limited the IP addresses and the ports, and they've tested it. And the goal is that the targets that they're actively scanning would be systems that they know are robust enough to withstand it. And typically these are Windows devices or Linux devices. And you can get lots of information as uh, Dean and Doug talked about there, and it can inform this remediation triage as well so that you're better 
prepared to to uh, make use of the time during the shutdown. One thing I do want to mention whenever you're using active scanning, even though there are things that you can do to manage the risk, you can't eliminate it 100% of the time. There could be a asset, a device that you've had on your list not to scan and somehow the list gets changed or its IP address gets changed and it, it uh, would get scanned. So do it very carefully and make sure that you test early and often. So let's just kind of look at some of the key takeaways. One is that you need to be continuously maturing your risk assessment. So if you're in one of these early practices where you're doing nothing, if it's not broke, don't fix it sort of things, think about how you can mature that risk assessment and work it into the maintenance phase. And you can use, as we talked about, a combination of the physical inventory, passive monitoring, active scanning to get that insight that you need. And the goal really, when we're talking about IT and OT convergence, is to make sure that from a security point of view, you're enabling the digitization initiatives that your organization is undertaking to improve their operations and uh, improve their performance. So with that, Doug, I'll turn it back to you and you can take us through some questions. Doug, I think you might be muted. Oh my goodness, thank you. Um, we, we don't have a shy audience. Um, it looks like so many have found how to submit questions and let's try to get to a few of those. So um, Dean, I, I'm gonna direct this one your way and let, I'm just gonna read the question as it came in. Uh, given the risk involved in the active scanning of industrial control systems, could you give some concrete examples where we would need active scanning that can't be discovered by passive scanning? Right, excellent, excellent question. So I'll probably answer it in a two-parter. Um, so passive scanning will give you information of a connected device, it's natural kind of communication path, but passive is usually a point in time, so it's a window. So what active scanning will give you above and beyond what passive will do is the consistent scanning, this consistent kind of interrogation of the network. Okay, so that's, 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 that's the clear benefit from that. I will caveat though, that testing the environment first for active scanning capabilities is gonna be key. So I'll also add to that, because um, the question could pop up, like if you know if we have active scanning in uh, a new environment versus an older old environment, what will the outcome be? Will active scanning essentially uh, you know uh, tip over systems and things like that? Generally, with newer systems, we do not find that not not the case. It's it's usually older legacy systems that are not able to keep up with active scanning. So active scanning in a new industrial control system environment with new upgraded gear or a new facility that's uh, just coming on stream, uh, the risk is gonna be lower in those kinds of situations because of the gear is gonna be upgraded, more capable to understand what the network scanning activity is gonna give you. Yep, that, that helps a lot. I think I think that addressed a good portion of that. Um, Ted, here, here's a different, a different question that has come in. How often have you seen active scanning inside industrial control system networks specifically? I think this this is probably expressing some of the concern or um, or or well, I'll, I'll say some of the concern with applying such technologies in existing systems. So, what have you seen? I have seen it being used more often than I thought. You know, I don't have a quantification of it, but I was at the. Uh, the industrial control system joint working group meeting in Albuquerque in the spring. And I talked to three or four people that when they heard I was tenable, they said, oh, we're using the Nessa scanners and those are active scanners. So that's where I started to talk to them about how they control it. And some of them do it only during shutdowns, but some of them do it in uh, network segments that they have tested it, they know that it's safe. So going back to the segmentation discussion, I think that you need to have the segmentation in place, uh, put the scanner in the safer segments higher up in the Purdue model, and then again, limit the IP addresses to uh, exclude any devices that might be older ones that are sensitive. Ted, since you're since you're talking already, uh, can you maybe discuss 
configuring a mirror, a mirror port or a span port, is that potentially going to introduce a hiccup or some type of a disruption to a system that's already operating? Can this be, can this be uh, an introduced while a system is actively running? I believe that it can. Um, the question, there are several questions about it. One is, do you have the capacity performance wise on the switch because this is going to use additional CPU cycles on the switch and it can slow things down a little bit. So again, I think you would probably want to do it during a, a shutdown if you possibly could or if you've got a newer switch that you know has got some additional capacity uh, on it, then it's probably safer than not. But Dean may have a, some insight on that as well. Yeah, so uh, good, I'm not muted. All right. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So it's all about what the switch can handle if, uh, and I don't want to get into numbers of what percentage and things like this of the, the, the workload, but essentially you have to understand what you're doing when you configure a span uh, configuration. And, and typically it's a configuration on the device, on the command line that you actually introduce in the configuration and kind of reload it without any kind of negative impact to the switch or router. So what you're effectively doing though is you're taking all of the data that's going to different ports on the switch and you're you're congregating all of that traffic into one one port the span port so you're essentially like increasing the level of processing that the switch has so it's all really about understanding uh what the capacity of the systems are how much ram is in the box how much cpu is in the box what i have seen successfully implemented in an industrial Turn more to your span or take things away from your span as well. So you can effectively add things in a phased approach to your span. Hey Dean, here's here's one. Uh, how do you describe the types of active scans that you would suggest? Scanning for open ports, querying specific protocols. How about drilling all the way down into device identity information? You know the vintage of uh, the firmware, uh, the software running on that. Right. So from a, from a cyber, uh, I know I'm just watching time here, from a cyber defense point of view, you really want to get an understanding of what assets you have. Firmware version is going to help you for sure. Protocols that are running your network is going to also be key. From a defense point of view, you do not want to only look at firmware versions. Looking at the protocol in an active defense uh, cycle is really how you're going to win as a defender. So that's a bit of a side conversation, but but to answer the question, you need to look for the ports that are open. You need to also look for what firmware is, is, is available, which can be achieved by physical inventory. But using active scan, you can interrogate the system to understand what software is running on there. But do not discount the value you will get from the protocols that are active and supposed to be on your network. The idea is to understand what's normal on your network, what protocols are normal, what communications are normal, and actively discern out what is abnormal. And that's how you will defend and understand if there's an adversary on your network to kick off, to kick off incident response. What do you think, Ted? How did Dean do? I think he did great. <laughs> so uh, in terms of the discovery scan, what we call it, and that's where you're just going through the, the ports and the protocols on a system, that's typically what can knock a system over. Uh, but that's a, a good place to start. And then going beyond that into an authenticated scan where you can really look at the system from the inside out uh, adds a lot of value in terms of installed software uh, versions of things. Uh, in fact, it can look for known malware uh, and find out if you got that on your system. Very good. Very good. Um, all right. We've, we've got one. I think we have time for one more here to squeeze in. So we have an inventory of our assets. Now, how do we store that data, secure that data, and make sure we can quickly search through it for risk profiling and risk management? So uh, is that question clear? What do we do with all that data? How long do we store it? How long, well, yeah, so I can, I can take that if you'd like and Ted interject if need be. Um, so how long do we store the data I'll get to? But in general, wherever you take the, 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 uh, the data from physical inventory, from active scanning or passive scanning, all of this needs to come into a database that's quickly searchable. Think about getting a threat intelligence report. Uh, you have software or a system that's vulnerable. Quickly taking that information and scoping your 
a risk profile by searching through your asset inventory will tell you if you're going to be affected by this or not. Storing the information is going to be in a searchable database. You want to make sure you have security on that database. This information is very valuable to you. It's very valuable to the adversary. So if the adversary gets this, a lot of their work is done for them. They now have a map of your network, which allows them to easily pivot through the network. How often do you store this? You want to store this indefinitely, essentially. You want to be able to add everything to your database. You want to be able to flag things that are old as well, though. You want to make sure what you have in your database is, is fresh, or at least flagged as in production, or used to have it, or not on the network or on the network. Fantastic. I'll tell you what, I think we're at time, so I'm going to express my thank you to uh, to, to Dean and uh, absolutely to Ted as well here. Um, I really appreciate your time. And Carol, I'm going to turn it back over to you so you can close this out.